son Jesus to not only die for our sin, take our place, but to conquer sin, death, and the grave, to be risen, to give us victory. Yeah. 
church, do you want revivals? Come on, one more time, let's sing this, come awaken. Come awaken your people, come awaken this city. God of revival, pour it out, pour it out now. Every stronghold will crumble. I hear those chains at the ground. God of revival, pour, pour it out now. Heavenly Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. I just thank you, Lord, for your presence here in this place, Lord. And Lord, we ask that you pour it out, Lord. I just thank you to said in your word, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, I will heal their land. Lord, we come before you, Lord. We say that unless you build the house, Lord, we labor in vain. We come to you, the rock, the name above all names that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, we worship you today. Lord, we thank you, Lord. And as a group, as your body, Lord, may we represent you well to this world that is lost and dying out there, going on about their business blind where the God of this world has blinded the hearts and the minds of men and women, kids, people, so they cannot see. I'd say, pray, Lord Jesus, we pray, Lord, from a place of humility that use us, Lord, to open eyes, Lord Jesus. Speak through us. May we represent you well, Lord, in every situation that you place us, Lord Jesus. May your love, may your light, may your presence shine, Lord Jesus. We come together today, Lord, to stand in the gap for this region. You created us with purpose, with meaning and value for good works before time began, Lord Jesus. So I just pray, Lord Jesus, as we lift our prayers together like incense, Lord, like arrows that go from this place, bend us, Lord Jesus. And we put prayers in your hands, Lord Jesus, that are arrows that we partner with you, Lord, to give you prayers that you can use. May we not be apathetic. May we not be lazy, Lord, with what we've been given, Lord, with intention, Lord. We ask for this Rockford area, the 49341 zip code for Cedar Springs, for Sparta, for Rockford, for Greenville, this whole West Michigan area, Lord, that a ripple of would rumble through this place, Lord Jesus, outside these four walls, that your kingdom would come, your will would be done in this place on earth as it is in heaven, Lord. We say, come in your power, Lord, fill this place. Let's sing that again one more time. today, Lord. Open our eyes, open our ears, and we position our hearts and our minds, our lives to receive from you, Lord. Fill us with the fullness of your goodness and your grace. We worship you in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Awesome. Well, uh, grab a seat. Uh, give somebody a handshake. Say hi um, as you're being seated. Welcome to anybody who's visiting online as well today. 
and uh, just excited to be here. Uh, 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 there's a Connect card in the back of your seat as well. If you take that, if you're a first-time visitor today with us, uh, grab that, fill it out. They have some merch in the back for you. Um, a lot better than making us uh, have you stand up if you're a first-time visitor and embarrass you. We'll give you uh, a gift. And it's uh, the purpose of that is just to create a point of contact to connect, to just, uh, um, to, just to say hi, build relationships. That's what we're about. Um, so fill that out. Again, in the back pocket, there is uh, a, my uh, a pastor Doug is in Greenville today preaching, and there's this all-in connect uh, this all-in card in the back of your seat as well, and that's about uh, supporting the building project that they have over there in Greenville. That the church has been growing and they're uh, breaking ground, and so uh, t take a look at that too. If God uh, leads you to support that as well, we're just uh, excited about what God is doing there, and. Um, also, another thing, uh, next week on the 28th, next Sunday, I don't know how this, this service is pretty full, but we have the 8 a.m. service that we've been having for a while up until uh, it, we just, there was a big buildup until Resurrection Sunday, and obviously as summer comes, things kind of taper off a little bit. And uh, so we're going to, after next week, will be the last week of the 8 a.m. service. So um, so don't, uh, if you'd like to come to that, uh, this is pretty full. So uh, we'll just stick with these, these two services that we have. And then um, uh, also Pastor Doug has been uh, uh, watching the Israel situation unfolding and staying right on the, uh, the, uh, the no with that. So he's going to have some podcasts that are coming out on YouTube and on uh, the platforms we have here as well. So pay attention to those if you want more information to stay up on the latest of that. And then um, I think that's about it until the wire, but I'm going to pray for the offering. And again, as you give today, um, just God loves a cheerful giver. And uh, just that you would give and know that uh, for, for us here at City Church and the different locations, um, that if you invest here with us, we, we see this as a God bank. It said that, you know, in the parable of the talents, I wish that you would have done something with what God had given you, at least invented, invested with the bankers. And I know uh, me being up at City Impact, um, a lot of the giving here goes to support what we do up there. And uh, there's just uh, so many different things that God is doing and using our money to grow the different things of his kingdom. And our goal is always to meet people's needs in a biblical way um, that is infused with the gospel with the love of Jesus. And that is always the template we run through. How is what we are doing bringing the love of Jesus to those in need? How are we using what God has given us? Given us? So as you give today, um, just uh, know that it is uh, being stewarded well. And I'm gonna pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you again as we give. Lord, we just give because uh, you, you first gave for us, Lord. And I pray that as we do that, Lord, that you um, just send it where it needs to go, Lord, that you take what is given, Lord, and multiply it into the hearts and lives of people, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done. Bless those who give, Lord. And we just thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. everyone. Welcome to City Church Rockford. As you give today, remember there are multiple ways you can give. Drop in the buckets as they are passed. Give online on our app or website. Put it in the boxes by the door as you exit or mail it into the church. Our men's and women's spring studies kicked off last week, but there still is time for you to sign up for any of these studies. So get signed up today on our app or website. City groups are also meeting right now, and we have lots of groups looking for new members. You can see all of the open groups or sign up to lead a group on our app or website. Our next Transformation Sunday is coming up soon on May 19th. We can't wait to hear stories of how God is working in people's lives and celebrate baptisms. A huge part of our spiritual growth is making the decision to be baptized, which is us choosing to publicly identify with the death and resurrection of Jesus. Baptism is the moment where we publicly let everyone know that we are choosing to follow Jesus with our whole life. If you are ready to be baptized, head over to our app or website to sign up. There are so many great things happening here at City Church. Head to our app or website for all of the details on everything going on. 
If there's anything else we can help you with, please go to one of our welcome centers in the lobby. Again, well, good morning. Um, so pumped to be here today. Uh, probably wondering why I'm not usually MC in the service or whatnot, but um, we have a special guest speaker with us today, uh, a, a gentleman who's become a good friend of mine, and uh, we have uh, Mr. Eric Gilmore with us today, and uh, yeah, give him a hand, say a couple things about him first, and, uh, and uh, how God has used him in my life. Um, just in, in our walk with God as he's so graceful with us and just he brings people into our lives at certain points in time. And, and of course, our goal here, my personal goal, all of our goal is just to love God well, to read his word, to obey it and do it as exactly how he tells us to do it. And in my pursuit of reading and coming before the Lord, Holy Spirit, teach me. Holy Spirit, lead me. I again, be, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and began to, of course, reveal as he always does uh, Loving God is the basis of everything we do. Jesus is the rock built on the firm foundation. And out of loving God and relationship and knowing him, everything else flows. So as I began pursuing those things, I listened to a lot of sermons on YouTube and things and look around. I was searching around, clicking around a few years ago, and I clicked on this guy. And uh, he just has a lot of stuff on there. I saw this conference and things, and I'm like, oh, who's this guy up there? Wow, you know, and he was talking about pat, uh, intimacy, pursuing God and these things. And some of these things I hadn't really experienced yet or anything like that, but they resonated with me. And so Eric has a ministry where he travels. It's called Sonship International. Uh, he's on a, he'll, he'll give a little bit of an intro to himself. I don't want to take too much time for him. But his, uh, where God has called him to do uh, is to um, exactly where the where Holy Spirit always leads us. And that is into knowing uh, him at a deeper level, pursuing him daily, experiencing his presence every day in every area of our life, being influenced by him. This is the whole world is under the influence of the God of this world. World. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. That means we are under the influence of the Holy Spirit in everything that we do. There's something about us that you can tell. So um, welcome. I'm going to have him come up here. Eric, uh, come up. Take it away. Give him a warm welcome. Love you, man. Well, praise God. I'm super excited to be with you guys. How many of you guys love the word? <laughs> Uh, the Bible tells us interesting things about this book right here. Number one, it is God's self-disclosure. This is what he wants you to know about himself. The scriptures tell us that all scripture is breathed out, and it's breathed out of God's mouth for us. Praise God. The, the word of God is living and active. Praise God. And today, I want to open up the word with you guys and let that precious voice speak life into us today. Very important. Turn to Ephesians chapter five, if you will. Uh, while you're turning there, I'll just tell you, I've, uh, I'm uh, married 20 years now. My oldest daughter is graduating high school this month. Uh, I have another daughter who's 13 years old. I live in Florida. We're part of uh, Nations Church in, uh, in, in Orlando, Florida. Wonderful place there. Uh, but like Pastor was saying earlier, we have hours and hours of teachings on YouTube. All on Amazon. You can uh, check out our music as well on all the music mediums and stuff. It's all made for that benefit and strengthening and edification of the church. So I uh, just want to put that in front of you. But uh, let me pray and then we'll jump right into the scriptures and let the Lord speak to us. What do you say? Praise God. Father, make my voice so like unto thine that even the weakest sheep will hear it and follow you. In your precious name. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 25. The scripture says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her <laughs> so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. 
He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church. Because we are members of his body, for this reason, he's quoting Genesis, for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Praise God. This is a revelation of what God desires and has designed things to move towards. The bride and the bridegroom. The picture being a husband and the wife. What God desires to have with us is so precious that he mirrors it to the most precious relationship on the planet between a husband and a wife. I want to point at this because today I want to talk to you about the, the marks, the chief marks of the bride. Uh, Jesus actually calls himself the bridegroom. Remember when they say, why don't your disciples fast? Jesus says, well, the bridegroom is with them. Jesus labels himself the bridegroom. That very label should open up a whole world for us of what he wants to reveal to us concerning us and him, bridegroom. John the Baptist also calls Jesus the bridegroom. He says, the the friend of the bridegroom hears his voice and rejoices. Jesus is revealed to be the bridegroom. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. We all know this verse and love it very much. It says this. It says, the spirit and the bride say come. So we have the last mention of the church here. And what are we called? The bride. Everything is moving towards a revelation of Christ as the loving bridegroom who revealed his love by laying down his life for us, who nourishes and cherishes us and keeps us and presents us back to himself. Praise God. Notice there that the last revelation of the church, the last revelation of us and our relationship to God is bride. It does not say that the spirit and the warriors <laughs> say come. It doesn't say the spirit and the Olympians. It doesn't say the spirit and the theologians. See, if he was looking for warriors, he'd be looking for the strongest. If he was looking for Olympians, he'd be looking for the highest efforts. If he was looking for theologians, he'd be looking for the best brains. But because he's looking for a bride, it reveals he's looking for love. Jesus desires the love of our hearts, our affections, our heart's affections. He longs for this. The first point I want to make today concerning the chief marks of the bride is this, that she prizes Christ above everything else. Samuel Rutherford once wrote, if we could rightly prize Christ, nothing would be bitter to us. You say, oh, that's a cool statement just to say, but who is this guy that said it? Well, Samuel Rutherford wrote that prison, wrote that from prison, literally in chains, he writes such a statement. Not, you know, with his feet up on the balcony in the Bahamas, drinking a margarita or something like this. He's not there. He's in prison. And he says, the presence of Christ, the presence of Christ, that's what makes all the bitterness of sorrow and suffering go away. So we have the bride here in Song of Solomon. If you want to turn to Song of Solomon, that's what we're going to look at. The bride and the bridegroom have their relationship explained and expounded upon in this book called Song of Solomon. I remember reading Charles Spurgeon one time concerning Song of Solomon. He said, we can see Christ on nearly every page of the Bible. But when you get to Song of Solomon, you see his heart. (laughs) The heart of Christ is revealed In this book right here, a love letter between two star-crossed lovers, if you will, to use the the words of Shakespeare. But you look at these, this love relationship, they seem to think that the entire world is a platform for their love. All they do is speak one to another. They run away to the secret place of the cleft of the rock. They hear one another's voice and they, they, they desire to be with one another. There's this love relationship that is so precious. Hudson Taylor wrote of Song of Solomon. He said, Song of Solomon is the divine warrant for the desire for sensible manifestations of his presence. 
Because you see every sense mentioned here. Your love is better than wine. Kiss me with the kisses of your mouth. Your oils are a pleasing fragrance. Your name is like oil poured forth. Draw me, I'll run after you. Therefore the maidens love you. It's this love relationship we see in this book of Song of Solomon. So when we see Song of Solomon, we have unveiled for us the beautiful end revelation of what God wants with us, a love relationship. It's a starry-eyed bride and a romantic king, this whole thing. So I'm pointing to Song of Solomon chapter five. I wanna show you something real quick. This is precious, being my first point, is prizing Christ, the bride, prizes Christ above everything else. And if we could rightly prize Christ, nothing would be bitter to us. So it says here in Song of Solomon chapter five, verse nine, the bride, which would be you, the bride is stopped and is asked, what kind of beloved is your beloved? So you can look at it like this. They stop her and they say, what is it about him that you like so much? Have you ever seen a girl that's like really beautiful and then like you see her choosing that guy and you're like, really? Him? <laughs> you know, what is it about him? And so to the world, Jesus has no treasure. To, to the world, he's like a root out of dry ground. But they turn to her and they say, what is it about this Jesus that is so special to you? What is it about this Jesus that moves your heart? And she says this outstanding statement here. She says, my beloved is dazzling and ruddy. The reason why that's interesting is because dazzling means white and ruddy means red, which shows us he is the spotless one who bleeds for us. You see, when you look at the heights of his brightness and the depths of his blood, you see none have went higher and none have went lower. Why do you love him? Because he's the greatest one in heaven. Why do you love him? Because he went lower than everybody on the earth. Praise God. The angels worship him because there's none above him. We worship him because none have went lower than him. Praise God. We see he scrapes the top and he scrapes the bottom. Highest heavens and lowest earth. Jesus Christ is the one who's worth all treasures all love. So she says here also an outstanding statement. We've all heard this before. She says, he is the chiefest among 10,000. Why do you love him? He's the chiefest among 10,000. The funny thing is, is that there's no such word as chiefest, but such is the, the weight of Christ's perfections. He breaks down vocabulary and causes men to make up words they've never known to articulate something they've never seen before. The chiefest among 10,000, she calls him. You say 10,000 what? Well, 10,000 whatever you want. 10,000 shepherds pale in comparison to the good shepherd. 10,000 preachers stand mute before the living word. 10,000 kings bow their knees before the king of kings, praise God. 10,000 angels drop their swords at the captain of the host of the Lord. And 10,000 lovers are forgotten next to the bridegroom who drips blood for us. Praise God. He's a, he, is, he, he is brightness extreme, yet a bleeding dream. This is Jesus, who we love so much. Inside of him, rubies turn to toys and emeralds sordid dust. Pride is worthless noise and mansions morbid rust. The scriptures say he's innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Why do you love him? He's the chiefest among 10,000. He's the fairest among the sons of men. Praise God. You won't find another like him. You can line every man up in all their goodness on one side of the scale and Jesus will always tip the scales. He's greater than the rest, praise God. See, he's higher than the angels and he's greater than the priests and every knee will bow to his exalted seat. There's seven stars in his hand and every crown is at his feet. Complete and perfect are his ways. He's the ancient of days. The earth and sky flee from his face. He's a person, a taste, a resting place, a refuge for any case. Oh, hasten the day when my faith shall be sighted because he's bright, my clothes become white. Oh, light, life, love, it's Jesus. Jesus above all, praise God. So we look, we see her here. They're saying, why do you love Jesus so much? Eric, what's your point? The chief mark of the bride is she prizes Christ. He is her treasure. Why is he her treasure? Well, because he's the chiefest among 10,000. See, he's, you look at the Old Testament, you see he's a better deliverer than, than Moses. Moses. 
He's a better captain than Joshua. He's a better king than David. He's richer than Solomon. He, he ascended higher than Elijah. He's closer to God than Enoch. He's more favored than Joseph. He's wiser than Daniel. He's the stone with seven eyes and the lamb slain in our stead. We look to Jesus as the one who is high above all. And if I could just push the door open to the king's chamber just an inch, one of those light rays will blind us to everything else in this world just to see who he is and his perfect beauty. We would reduce ourselves down to one thing. I desire only one thing, Lord, to dwell in your presence and to behold your beauty. Praise God, to see Christ as he is. As I told you, if we could rightly prize Christ, nothing would be bitter to us and it would persuade all men to love and delight in God. The second mark of the bride, I believe, is her loss of self in another. The Bible says the two are no longer two, but one. She loses herself in him. Or you could look at it as she gives herself completely over to him. She's one with him. The Bible says he who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. This means that she looks to him now to be everything to her. She's not looking for what people can do for her anymore. She's looking directly at all that he is for her. I remember uh, my wife and I went to a, a wedding and the preacher got up and said that famous statement. The bride is looking at the bridegroom and the preacher says, forsaking all others, keeping only to thee. And when I heard that statement, man, it went through my heart. And I said, oh Lord, let me be that. Let me forsake all others and keep only to you all my days, God. That's marital love. That's the loss of self in another. That's bride and bridegroom. This is what God longs for. In Matthew 10, verse 37, there's this, what is called harsh statement in the scriptures where Jesus says, if anybody loves father or mother or more than me, then they're not worthy of me. You remember this statement? And people say, oh, that's a hard saying. But if you look at it from love's eyes, you can see all he's saying really is, will you marry me? You say, how? Well, I mean, imagine a guy who meets this girl, okay? Or let's say a girl comes in to the back of this, this room, a single guy sees her and he says, man, she's, I'm gonna talk to that girl today. He goes over to her, he says, man, I was stunned at the sight of you. I'd give anything to take you out. Will you go out with me? She says, yeah, oh, sure. So they, they go out one night and then they start spending a little bit more time together. Then they start spending all their time together. And then finally, they're laying on the grass in a sunny day with a picnic. And he turns to her and he looks at her and he says, I love you and I wanna marry you. Will you be my wife? And then she says to him, you know, if you marry me, you're saying no to all the other girls. And he says, exactly. I want only you forever. That's marriage. And that is what Jesus is saying when he says, whoever won't love me more than everybody else, they're not worthy of me. It's just a marriage proposal. It's not a hard saying at all. It's an invitation to marry Christ, to have all in him. Imagine if, if he looked at her and he said, will you marry me? And she says, yes, I'll marry you. And then he says, but one thing, I'm never gonna love you as much as my mom. <laughs> Do you think she's gonna be okay with that? No, she's gonna be like, no, 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 no. I'm not entering into that world. In other words, chief affection, highest place. Marital union is forsaking all others, keeping only to you. This is what Christ gave to us as the parallel, as the type and shadow of what he longs to have of your heart, a heart's affection where he, run, he reigns unchallenged in the heart. This is what he longs for. I feel as if Jesus would look at us all today and say this, marry me, he says. Marry me, let me be all to thee. None can be what I can be. Fill your soul with ecstasy and fill your heart with joy and peace. Make internal wars to cease. Lift you above life's miseries and take you into my mysteries. Share with you my victories. Love you now and endlessly and marry you eternally. It's only I that can do these things. Jesus has the right to demand everything from you because he knows he's the only one that can actually fulfill you. You know, you look, you look at what it means to be married to Jesus. 
You think of uh, even the, the story of Abraham uh, searching out a bride for his son. Do you remember this? And he sends his servant out and his servant goes looking for a bride. He sees this cute girl by the, by the well. He says, could this be it? Holy Spirit, is, is this the one? And then bam, he realizes she could be the one. She goes back home and he's got all these treasures for her, gifts. And he's like, listen, I've been sent here for you to marry you know, my, my master. And he starts giving her these jewels and to, to draw her in because it is extensions of the bridegroom's love for her, to be able to marry her. And then this question comes to her, which is very interesting. They say, will you go with this man? And her answer is, I will go with this man. So what that means when she says, I will go, is she's now saying, I'm not going to look to my dad or my mom anymore for provision. I'm gonna find that in him. I'm not gonna look to my friends anymore for the social support that I need. I'm gonna go be with him. He's gonna be that for me. I'm gonna leave all that I've known here in my life and all the security that I've had in my life and I'm going to start everything brand new and find everything in him. I'm leaving all the relationships that I've had uh, emotionally here and I'm gonna find everything now in him. Christ being bridegroom means he offers himself to us to be all to us. And this is what she decides here. So that's second mark of the bride. The first one is that she prizes Christ. The second one is that she loses herself in him. She longs for him above all. And then the last one is this. The third chief mark of the bride is that she longs to be with him. See, lovers love to be alone. They instinctively seek retreat, a retreat in which no other voice is heard and no other face is seen. You think of like Shakespeare who tries his best to explain love and he fails miserably next to a bleeding God. But he says things like this in, in, in one of the plays Shakespeare writes, he's talking of love and he goes, how weary, stale, flat and unprofitable seem to me all the things of this world. Why? Because he's fallen in love and he sees that compared to having love relationship with her, how weary, stale, flat and unprofitable seem to me all the things of this world. That's the same kind of internal switch that happens when a heart sees the beauty of Christ and chooses to marry him. How weary, stale, flat and unprofitable seem to me all all the things of this world if I have not Christ. You see, you can take everything from me and give me Christ and I still have everything. Because Christ is all in all. What about when Juliet looks at Romeo and what does she say? All my fortunes at thy foot I lay to follow you around the world. What a love statement. And that pales in comparison to God who chooses to drop down out of heaven by the weight of love into the restrictions and frailties of a human body to breathe as we breathe and speak as we speak and to communicate to us his love and to die on that tree as a spectacle of marriage proposal that we would give our hearts and our love to him. He died for us that we who live no longer live for ourselves, but him who died and rose from the dead. Praise God. This is love beyond compare. This is a romance of the ages. Every single romantic movie you've ever seen in your life pales in comparison to this God. As a matter of fact, the only reason why you like those is because they have hints and touches of what he is for mankind. We are made to have all satisfied by the bridegroom and find everything in Jesus. Praise God. I find sometimes there's a guy and he's like, hey man, I, I got my eyes on this girl right now. I'm not gonna seek, I'm not gonna seek the Lord you know, as hard as I want to right now because I got my eyes on this girl right now. Let me just ask you a question. Did she bleed for you? She's not bled for you. I'm pursuing a career right now. That's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm not gonna seek God right now with all my heart because I got this career that I'm pursuing. Well, did that career pursue you out of heaven into the earth? Well, well you don't understand. I, I've, I've got these uh, other things that have these hobbies that I like, so I'm not gonna seek the Lord like I could because I just wanna give all my time, all my time to my hobbies. I'll tell you this, none of those hobbies, hobbies rose from the dead for you. Everything pales in comparison to Christ. I think of people like Robert Murray McShane who says this, he says, he says, a calm hour with God is worth a lifetime with any man. You, you turn to Song of Solomon chapter two, verse three, and you start seeing how much she loves to be with him. She says this, like an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. This is the bride talking about her bridegroom, her, her lover, the, her husband. And she says, he is an apple tree and everybody else is a tree of the forest. 
The distinguishing factor is he's the only one that has nourishment for my soul. The trees of the field, they don't have anything but bark to give to you. But Christ, as the apple tree, he alone can nourish and satisfy the soul. And she goes on here and she says, in his shade, I took great delight and I sat down and his fruit was sweet to my taste. Oh, I wonder if there's somebody in this room that has never experienced the snap, crackle, pop of beautiful, blissful enjoyment of God. The Lord invites you to a life of marital union with him where that snap, crackle, pop and taste of the apple upon your tongue is your daily reality to enjoy and take great delight in him underneath his shadow. Praise God. I think of things like the old Puritan prayer that says, no hours pass away with such delight as those that are spent in communion with thee. I wish to spend all my time on you. Help me to make you my only end. Or you think of the, the words from Samuel Rutherford as well when he's in prison, when they put him in prison, they said, he said, they thought they put me in prison, but this prison is a palace to me. They laid me in his arms. He says, my chains, yeah, they're gold. Praise God. You think of, you think of uh, Richard Wormbrand, who's put in prison for preaching Christ and he's put 14 feet beneath the earth in solitary confinement for seven, not hours, not days, not months, years. He's in solitary confinement. And what he says of his prison time there, he goes, they didn't know, but they gave me, they gave me symbols with which I could praise my Lord. He says, I knew the bridegroom, his caresses and his kisses. It was one of the most beautiful times of my life. What does that mean? It means he married the Lord and the Lord became all his satisfaction, even when he had nothing. I submit to you that that's gospel reality, Christ fulfilling everything inside of man and finding all in him. I think of somebody like David Brainerd, who's on horseback in Pennsylvania, freezing to death. He's got tuberculosis. He's dying, coughing up pieces of his lungs, trying to find the Indians out there to preach the gospel to them. And one night he, let, he sits down to write in his journal, which he does. If you haven't read the journals of David Brainerd, they are spiritually stirring. He sits down and probably with a red smile, because he's coughing up blood, with a red smile, he writes down in his journal, an hour with God infinitely excels all the pleasures and delights of this lower world. What is that? That's called marital Christianity. That's called marriage to Christ. That's finding the bridegroom as all. Praise God. Or the great Charles Spurgeon, who I love so much, the prince of preachers. He stands up and he says, it is worthwhile to have lived, if for nothing else, than to have had a half an hour's fellowship with the well-beloved. What a statement. It's worth my whole life is worthwhile if I can just spend a half hour with Jesus. I wonder if our high prizing of Christ would bring us to that kind of cherishing of being alone with him, recognizing him as treasure, so much so that you, you long to hear his voice and you're looking for time alone with him. I feel like what the Lord was even kind of bringing me here to, to point at is, is that he's presenting himself to us. I wrote this poem down just to kind of pull together everything that I'm trying to say to you in one major statement. And I feel like the Lord is saying to everybody here, myself, I present to you as one sent to you, mocked and rent for you, blood spent for you, death sentenced to cross shame and grave. Oh, let me save you again. Only I can mend through the spirit that I send. So come to me, be one with me and unto me live and give your soul and you'll be whole and you'll know my father. Are there any others with affections greater than mothers, deeper than lovers? I'll smother your sins away and cover you with my pinions and lay you on my chest. Quieted rest, ended quest, stilled and caressed. Oh, I'm the best for you. Victory through making you new by a love you've never known with a substance I alone am for I alone am the son of man. I feel like the Lord is reaching today. If, if, if I was to, to really put everything together in, in, in one feeling, it would be this. I feel like the Lord stands up here today and reaches with love. I feel as if his hand is out and he's saying, love me. Take my love. Receive my love. You'll find everything you need in my love. 
All you're looking for, all the holes in your soul be filled by my love. Take my love. And in receiving his love, we will, re we will realize that he's the one who makes us spotless. He's the one who takes on the responsibility to make us blameless. He's the one who keeps us in his presence. He's the one who does all the work if we just turn our heart's love to him. And what it will look like is not only prizing Christ above all things, but prizing him enough to recognize the loss of yourself in him. And lastly, to realize fellowship with him. Oh, it's the highest goal. It is it, it's the center. It's the yoke of the Christian life. We take that out and our love begins to fail. Our love is fostered by the reception of his love alone with him and in the enjoyment of him. I said in, in the first service that, that fellowship with God is like the first button on the shirt. If you get the first button right, all the other ones are right. But if you get the first button wrong, no matter how well you do and tight, you do the other buttons, they're all wrong. And so it is with a lot of us, our Christianity, we've got all these other things in order. Everything's so tight. I don't do this anymore. I do this now and I serve here and I do that. But if the fellowship button is not right, then they're all wrong. You're missing the whole point. I mean, you even look at the church of Ephesus in, in, um, in Revelation when Jesus is speaking to the church, it's funny, it's the church of Ephesus, which is the very church, the mysteries revealed to of bride and bridegroom. And what he says to them is that they've left, not lost, left their first love. And he says, remember the height, the height from which you fell. In other words, the fellowship with Christ and love relationship with Christ is the high places. It's living above the earth. It's in the wonderful world of that precious, holy stratosphere with God, where you can go above the clouds and look down on the problems of life. Not that they're no longer there, but that you are lifted above them by the sweetness of enjoying God and the, and the wonder of his presence, the precious glistening of his streams inside of your heart. He's up here, that's the heights with God. Then he says, remember those heights. Remember the times you had with me when it was just us and we enjoyed one another. Maybe there's a person right here right now, you know exactly what I'm talking about by enjoying the bliss of his presence. But recently, because of so many things and anxieties and maybe somebody hurts you and stuff, I'm not diminishing any of those things. I'm just saying they are secondary to Christ. I'm saying all those things, though they may feel certain ways and they can have negative effects in many ways, there's something so much more precious than those things. And it is fellowship with Christ, wherein the healing balm lies, where God can come in and do that thing that is needed. So. They say, he says, you've left your first love. <laughs> you've left your first love. Remember the heights from which you've fallen. Praise God. The, the funny thing too about that church is that their, their doctrine is really good. They're able to discern who's wrong and right. Jesus tells them, that's good, that's good. Their, their duty is right. They, they're like Marines that take the beachhead. They persevere in the midst of, of pain, that's toil. They're like Marines who take the beach. Yeah, we're doing this. And then also they're, they're stay, they stay away from sin because the scripture says if anybody has sin, they don't have anything to do with it. So you have their doctrines right, their duties on, and they have no dirt. You know, they're not messing around with sin. But Jesus still says, none of those things mean that you love me. None of those things mean that you're in the heights of fellowship with me. He says, remember the heights and come back to first love where I'm first place, where you love me above all others. And I think we'll find that as we put Christ in the highest place, everything else just is arranged right. I'll end with this story. My, my daughter and I laid down uh, at night one night in the this, in this grass and we looked up at the stars in the sky and my daughter turns to me, she's little at that time. She goes, Daddy, there's so many stars in the sky. And I said, yeah, yeah, baby, there's a lot of stars in the sky. Then she says, where do they go in the daytime? And I said, oh, baby, they're always there. It's just the sun is so high and so bright that you can no longer see them. And I realized something right there, that if I lift the sun, Jesus, to the heights, he extinguishes all the other lights. But if I remove the sun from the heights, I start seeing all kinds of other lights. Madame Guyon called Christ the superior effulgence of the chief luminary, specifically saying, the light that flows forth from this man, Christ Jesus, makes everything else disappear. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Would you stand to your feet with me?
can we, can we just pray something together? Because I'm not here today as a doctor. I'm here as a fellow patient in need of Christ, longing for Christ, wanting the Holy Spirit to do a fresh work in my life as well. So let's put our hands on our hearts together. Let's pray this together. I say, Jesus, I hear you. Your invitation to marry you again, to forsake all others and to keep only to you. I return to first love. I ask you even now for the quickening of your spirit. Shed abroad the love of God in my heart. In your precious name, in Jesus' name, amen. an amazing picture and I love how just God flows through to constant just flowing out and putting that all together and, and to create this picture of what God's love is and his relationship for us and I can't help but listen to that message and sit out there and just thinking of again how we apply this in our life obviously I said that before we started loving God is the outworking of that relationship that has the ripple effect of everything else that we do and that motivation for our life but I would say this is a prophetic word but in a room this size I just I know it to be true that there are marriages in this room today that are in trouble <laughs> God wants to see, he's calling out. So many times, like Eric said, we, we go grab at these other things and you're wondering about doing these big things for God. We have so many opportunities right in our home. It starts first with him, then our family, our wife, our family. God has put you in, in, in our, if you have a marriage that's struggling, you have every opportunity in your home. I believe that God wants to speak specifically to marriages right now. Why do you think the devil attacks marriages so much? Why do you think he wants to destroy family, identity, everything? Because everything in family is a picture. Every single husband in this home is a pastor of your home, of your family. It is a model of the church. So what we're doing here today is just a bigger represent, representation of what each and every one of us as a family, as a father and a husband and a wife have in our home. So. We're gonna sing a song here in a minute and have some ministry time, but I just wanna to speak to uh, just to the marriages and, and that God is uh, able to, to heal, to touch. And I know for me, this to be true just because of what I've been through. In my own marriage, God used the difficulties that my wife and I went through to be, I would say, the greatest thing that, that healed not only our marriage, but drew me to him. And we use the word so many times as this thing to, to position ourselves where he said, she said, and try to find ways that to justify and legitimize the reason why we're not okay and why it's okay for us not to be okay. And I wanna tell you, and you go to God. You let every opportunity where you could be rubbed wrong or whatever drive you to God. I went into counseling and, and, and the coping was, what do you do to cope? Do you pull away? Do you run? Do you drink? Do you look at things you're not supposed to do? What do you do to be okay? And, and the, the guy I went to counseling, he almost didn't believe me by God's grace. I had coped with all those things in the past, but he had brought me to a place where I ran to God to cope. And he almost didn't believe me. He was like, what do you mean you go to God? And for my wife too, there's things in all of us and stuff, but God used what we went through in our marriage to bring us to a place. He would not let us get past that. So if that's you today, Lord, I just pray for the marriages in this room, for the family, Lord. I just pray that people are, that you just uh, stir in their hearts, that people run to you, Lord Jesus, and fix their eyes on you. It said, you said that the, the, the ruler of this world, the devil comes and he has nothing in me, Lord Jesus. And, and Lord, that meant that there was nothing that, he, that could be stirred up, Lord Jesus, to make him not okay. Lord, and in for our marriages, Lord, it, you just said, 
Lord, get the log out of our own eye before we take the speck out of the others. It isn't that there isn't something with the, the other person, Lord Jesus, but to us, what it reveals in us, Lord, you want to heal. It only hurts if it's alive, Lord, and you want to touch these things in our life that hurt because they need to die, Lord, and you use our spouses, Lord, to identify those things. So, Lord, I pray healing and speak healing over the marriages in this room right now. And as we worship and as we pray, prayer team is going to come up front here. We're going to worship and um, we're going to have some ministry time and then we'll close. But come up front if you need prayer and we're going to sing and we're going to worship our way out.
As we close in these last few moments, I just, well, so I, I, I heard a name in my heart, and uh, this could be, a, if it's a word for specifically, I believe, for somebody, and any word that's given, if it applies to you, reach out and grab it. But I heard the name Derek, and maybe that he's even listening online, but that you, uh, that have been, this person has been successful, and you've had a lot of the things and tasted a lot of things that life has had to offer, and you're at a point in your life right now where um, you're wondering, is God real? And you may, you're even tuning in, uh, intrigued by church, intrigued by uh, of, of, of what you see, and you are asking the question, and that God would speak specifically to you today that says, yes, I am real, and I am uh, working in your life right now, and just uh, what you heard today. Seek me, and you'll find me. Knock, and the door will be open. A simple word, and I uh, just wanted to just put that out there for whoever, and just to be, for all of us, he is real. God, we must first believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So let us be a people who do that, who seek him with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, Lord, I bless uh, your people as they go today outside these four walls. Fill us with your presence. Fill us with your love and your to be salt and light, Lord, in every area that you send us this week. Till by your grace and your love, you bring us back here again, Lord. And we just thank you and worship you for what you're doing in this place. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. All right, you are dismissed. Have a wonderful day. Prayer team will be up here for a bit. And uh, God bless.